So I've been asked to talk about one of the most compelling bits of genetic evidence regarding human chromosome number 2 that points to common ancestry among the great ape family, just as evolutionary theory would predict. Before bringing it out, some background information ought to be brought forward so we know how compelling it really is. Chromosomes are fragments of DNA that constitutes part of an organism's genome, and one chromosome is made up of a pair of sister chromatids. These chromatids are then made up of chromatin, which can be described as large packets of DNA tightly wound up around histones. Certain regions of this tightly wound DNA are given particular names, namely centromeres and telomeres stabilized by proteins. Centromeres are bits of the chromosomes that bind the sister chromatids together during cell replication, while telomeres are repetitive bits on the ends of chromosomes that provide protection of the important DNA from deterioration as the cell replicates over time. While the particular form of the chromosomes can vary between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, the general position and function of centromeres, telomeres, and other important bits of the chromosomes themselves are fairly predictable. Part of the vast variation within the eukaryotic domain, particularly within the kingdom Animalia, can be seen in the number of chromosomes between different species, with guppies having 64, fruit flies just 8, and kingfishers with 132. Humans usually have 46 chromosomes, while the other hominids like gorillas and chimps have 48. This brings up the pertinent question, why do humans have 46 chromosomes, a pair less than gorillas and chimps, the closest non-human relatives? While creationists might defer to something like God did it, as science advocates, we look at the data, particularly the chromosomes themselves, to find the answer. So if evolutionary theory postulates that any two or more organisms share a common ancestor, it would explain this chromosomal difference between human and non-human hominids by suggesting that humans or their immediate ancestors underwent some kind of chromosomal fusion event that resulted in the merging of a pair of chromosomes into one, thus turning the chromosome count from 48 to 46. If this falsifiable hypothesis is correct, we ought to see some markers or remnants of this merging of chromosomes. Specifically, it would make sense that we might find extra centromeres and extra telomeres, and that's exactly what we find in human chromosome number 2. Not only are these extra centromeres and telomeres in the precise places where we'd expect them to be in a fused chromosome pair, but this serves as another example of the vestigial structure, residual traits that are no longer used for the purpose they evolved for. That's a bonus point for evolutionary theory. We can also observe that the fused chromosome number 2 has nearly identical DNA sequences to the chromosomes of the chimpanzee genus. This becomes pretty interesting when the chimp's identical DNA with chromosome 2 actually comes from different chimp chromosomes, meaning that we can actually identify the two chromosomes that would have actually merged together to form the second human chromosome, thus validating the hypothesis that common ancestry predicted. The cells of all great apes, like chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, contain 24 pairs of chromosomes. If humans share a common ancestor with apes, you'd expect us to have the same number. But surprisingly, human cells contain only 23 pairs. The question is, if evolution is right about this common ancestry idea, where'd the chromosome go? Well. Evolution makes a testable prediction. And that is that somewhere in the human genome, we ought to be able to find a piece of scotch tape holding two chromosomes together, so that our 24 pairs, two of them were pasted together to form just 23. And if we can't find that, then the hypothesis of common ancestry is wrong and evolution is mistaken. Next slide. To solve this riddle for the court, Miller would show how scientists discovered traces of our evolutionary past buried in the very structure of a chromosome carried by all humans. Typically, on the ends of every chromosome, you should find special genetic markers, or sequences of DNA, called telomeres. And in their middles, you should find different genetic markers called centromeres. But if a mutation occurred in the past, causing two pairs of chromosomes to fuse, we should find evidence in those genetic markers, telomeres not only at the ends of the new chromosome, but also at their middles, and not one, but two centromeres. Finding a structure like this in our chromosomes would explain why humans have one pair fewer than the great apes. And if we don't find that, then evolution is in trouble. Next slide. Lo and behold, the answer is in chromosome number two. All of the marks of the fusion of those chromosomes predicted by common descent and evolution, all those marks are present on human chromosome number two. So the case is closed in a most beautiful way. And that is, the prediction of evolution of common ancestry is fulfilled by that lead pipe evidence that you see here in terms of tying everything together.
that our chromosome, formed by the fusion from our common ancestor, is chromosome number two. Evolution has made a testable prediction, and it has passed. So modern genetics and molecular biology actually support evolutionary theory? They support it in great detail. And the closer we can get to looking at the details of the human genome, the more powerful that evidence has become. Darwin didn't even know about molecular biology and DNA, yet that's where some of the most profound evidence is, is being uncovered today. Think about that. That somebody in the 1800s made predictions that are being confirmed in molecular biology labs today. That's a very profound statement of a very successful theory. Not a single observation, not a single experimental result has ever emerged in 150 years that contradicts the general outlines of the theory of evolution. Any theory that can stand up to 150 years of contentious testing is a pretty darn good theory, and that's what evolution is. As someone always looking for a good argument, I of course looked for how creationists account for these observations, and what better source than the Institute for Creation Research. Written by Jeffrey Tompkins, an apparent PhD in genetics from Clemson University, this 2013 article claims that, in 2002, 614,000 bases of DNA surrounding the fusion site were fully sequenced, revealing that the alleged fusion sequence was in the middle of a gene originally classified as a pseudogene because there was not yet any known function for it. The research also showed that the genes surrounding the fusion site in the 640,000 base window did not exist on chimp chromosomes 2a or 2b, the supposed ape origin's location. In genetics terminology, we call this discordant gene location a lack of synteny. Now, rather than make a fool out of myself by feigning knowledge that I don't actually possess, something I wish some people would also do, I'll let an actually qualified individual break this down for us. The first thing that you should notice is that he's calling this new research, even though there's an 11-year gap between the articles he's citing and this article. 11 years is a very long time in science, especially considering the revolution in genome sequencing technology in the past decade. But now let's examine his claims. Let's start by breaking down what Tompkins' claims actually mean. He is claiming that the fusion site was in the middle of a gene that was considered a pseudogene. A pseudogene is a gene that has been deactivated and no longer has a functional role. He is also alleging that genes surrounding the fusion site are not located on the unfused chimp chromosomes at the predicted locations. We can now look to the paper that examines this claim. The first paper cited is called Gene Content and Function of the Ancestral Chromosome Fusion Site in Human Chromosome 2Q13 through 2Q14.1 and Paralogous Regions. The second paper is titled Genomic Structure and Evolution of the Ancestral Chromosome Fusion Site in 2Q13 through 2Q14.1 and Paralogous Regions on Other Human Chromosomes. I don't want to be pedantic, but you can tell from the titles of the papers that these scientists accept evolution and the mainstream account of the chromosomal fusion. The abstracts of both papers list extensive evidence for the fusion, so I have to wonder if our creationist friend bothered to read either article. Tompkins, here's an unsolicited tip from one scientist to another. If you're going to cite an article, make damn sure that it agrees with you. Now, let's address his first claim. Quote, the alleged fusion site was in the middle of a gene originally classified as a pseudogene because there was not yet any known function for it. According to the first paper he cited, there are multiple pseudogenes that are in the fusion region examined. More than that, the smallest window examined for this fusion site is 68 KB. That's a window of 68,000 nucleotides. So, one has to ask, why is this interesting or significant to Tompkins' case? Seriously, I have no clue. His second claim is that there are new genes in the region. This is true, but the papers talk about how these are duplicated genes for the most part. I don't know how he could have missed that without being blatantly dishonest. He also alleges a lack of syntony, but the second paper he cites put sequence identity for the region at about 96 to 97 percent between humans and chimps. How is that a lack of syntony? That's in line with most estimates of human-chimp genetic relatedness. One seriously has to question whether Tompkins knows what he's talking about or is just lying to everyone. I seriously cannot tell because of the laziness he put into this research. So it turns out, unsurprisingly, that creationists, even those with ostensibly legitimate PhDs in genetics, don't actually have a convincing case for not only why humans have 46 chromosomes while the other great apes have 48, but also why the fused human chromosome is derived from completely separate chimp chromosomes, evident rather strikingly by vestigial centromeres and telomeres, and their identical genetic markers that illustrate genetic syntony. 
only evolutionary theory can explain why all three of these facts exist. I only wish it were possible to sequence the genomes of long-extinct hominins like Sahelanthropus, Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo heidelbergensis to really narrow down when this chromosomal fusion event may have occurred. Interestingly, the most recently extinct human species, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, appear to have the same merged chromosome. So we know that it's not a distinctly sapiens trait, thus compounding the creationist eternal dilemma of trying to distinguish our species as unrelated to any other species on Earth while only adding complexity to the continuous evolutionary epic that appears only from having a proper understanding of evolutionary theory.